happening now. Um, thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, today we've got our handling misconduct cases and we've got Richard Slater and Steve Hatch from our Australian Sailing Rules Specialist Group to join us and to talk us through handling misconduct cases for your clubs. So I've got a series of questions here that I'm going to pose to you both if you don't mind. And um, Steve, we'll start with you because you were awfully quiet as we were trying to get Richard in. So um, <laughs> Steve, <laughs> can you um, explain to us who holds responsibility for handling a misconduct complaint at an event? So the organising authority um, would normally appoint a um, protest committee to handle the um, misconduct case. And um, and they would then um, quite possibly appoint an investigator if they don't have all the facts to actually um, look into the matter and see whether it's worthy of being um, going to a hearing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Richard, do you have anything to add to Steve's no, question there? It's really simple. It's the protest effectively it should be run by the protest committee because they look after the any cases in regards to the sport, the sporting aspects. So let the mm -hmm. protest committee. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if it's a field of play, then it should be on the protest committee. Yeah. Excellent. So when one is received then a, a misconduct um, um, case, what would be the first thing that um, that particular um, panel must do, Richard? Um, my advice would be you start with take a breath and do everything formally. Um, so I like to make sure that, for example, if the club rings me up and goes, we've got this case, say, OK, we'd like you, I, I want to make sure that I've been formally appointed to be the protest committee so that I've I've got these little things all in line, and if we line them all up properly, we'll never have to worry about them again. So normally you want to be appointed as the protest committee looking at it. And then the next process really, like anything formally, would be a, an acknowledgement of the receipt. So um, normally when you get a complaint, it's for the person who's making that complaint, they want to make sure their voice has been heard. So thank you for your complaint. We've done so, and we've got um, been appointed to investigate this or look into this complaint. Mm -hmm. um, I think they're the first first few steps. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Steve, can you add, add anything to what Richard said? Do you agree? Do you oh, no, I agree you know, completely. <laughs> you mean... Um, Clearly. It, Good man, Steve. You, Good man. you need to take your time and make sure it's done right. Mm -hmm. That is the critical part of this whole process when you get into misconduct is that nobody rushes, it's done properly and you cover off every step along the way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. All right. Um, everyone listening, I didn't mention before, if you've got any questions as we go through, please pop them in the chat. I've got it open next to me so I can certainly ask Richard and Steve if there's anything that you can think of throughout. Um, so our next question was, um, who do you need to get into place to have a look at it? So we've, we've, we know that it's the organising authority. We know that we need to have a formal procedure and, and receipt the the, um, the complaint. Who is the best sort of people to, to have a look at it, Steve? Well, I mean, the protest committee should look at it to start with, mm -hmm. get together the committee, um, circulate the document and... Um, and review what the complaint is so that you can um, come to an opinion whether there's enough information there, whether it warrants further action, whether um, if there's stuff missing that you'll need to um, investigate that. And quite often that's better if you get somebody outside the protest committee to investigate it that they can then find out the details into the details of the complaint and and then that assists later on when you if you get to a hearing. Mm -hmm. Richard, do you think there are any um, 
soft skills that the people in the protest committee, like the the best sort of people to um to have within that committee? Like, what well, sort of what sort of skills do you think these people would need? I think I think you can work that out. Most clubs will someone you know it's not the protest committee that gets handed this complaint normally it'll go to the sailing office and someone who's either the volunteer of the day you know race officer or uh, a paid paid employee of the club gets this gets this and it's quite nice for them to say right we're now gonna you know those first couple of steps we talked about was good because that takes a lot of pressure off those people going we need to appoint a committee and they'll know at the club who are the ones who could handle this at least you know one or two of the sort of um calmer more people with a bit of the skills knowing the rules as well who've been on the protest committees before um, i agree with steve and hatchie and i did a, a a review of a complaint not too long ago and you get a complaint you read it like suggest hatchie suggested and it's looked like there was a good case regard. It was a valid case of misconduct, but there was things missing in the complaint. You know, who actually yelled at them, all that. And I think Hatchie and I, we, we both sort of went, well, that's where it would be good to get an investigator where someone can do the extra sort of chasing up so that when it starts the next processes, we're already backfilling it. We're coming up with, with facts rather than a lot of missing information. So, um, yeah, I, I agree that that first thing's in place is the protest committee and then never be scared to sort of bring a new person in to investigate. And that, that's, that's useful. So where would this new person come from, though? Is this um, would within the club still? Was it somebody fresh to the club? What's your advice there? I, I think it's within the club. It, mm -hmm. It's what and what you're looking for is you're looking for the person to to get the last bits of evidence, mm -hmm. um, you know, misconduct is such a broad range of things. So, you know, this example we had, which was someone saying things were inappropriate on the racetrack. Well, we just needed to know who off the boat said the information or we needed to know exactly what was said and co have it corroborated rather than just the one complainant. And for us, it was useful to use someone at the club, one in, in the race committee, who had a working relationship with all the people involved, who could do that, who could who could talk to them, talk to the complainant again. And now I think our instructions are simply document everything and can you write down what you've, you're about to tell us? Don't just ring us up and tell us, just send it to us in email so we've got it documented. Mm -hmm. um, I, but it's again, it's more of that club. If, you, if you're knowing that it's something, maybe if it's children, you may want to bring someone who's involved, you know, in the coaching or in, in that area to try and find out what, what happened. Um, so that one, I think you, you guys can sort of have that feel. It is a soft feel. It's who's the best person just to get to this answer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And of course, one of the things, Mel, we have to remember is that Misconduct comes to a protest committee in two ways. One is through a report, as Richard was talking about, it's delivered to the sailing office or to the race committee or whatever. The other is where the protest committee learns itself from an admission somebody makes or from conduct in an actual protest hearing. Um, sometimes people don't like the decision and may you mean have misconduct or somebody, you mean we had a case um, earlier in the year where a person said, oh, I admit that I made these remarks to one of the officials. And um, so we can get the case from two different directions. Obviously, if we learn about it ourselves, then that's easy. You mean there's not going to be any gaps. Mm -hmm. But if it's at a club, yeah, best to get somebody, as Richard says, that knows the sailors, that knows the people involved, because we as a protest committee quite often don't know the people. Mm -hmm. you mean, we might see them in the room occasionally or whatever, but um, we don't, you mean, know them to go and sort, find them out in the car park or the boat or the marina. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, and while we're talking about these examples, um, without going to too much detail, obviously we've had a question. Um, Colleen has asked, could we have um, an example of misconduct? What could potentially be classed as misconduct without a hard and fast rule? <laughs> um, a classic one we get is uh, would be language. Uh, inappropriate language and that's actually quite an interesting one because it can be due to the context you know but uh, if it was just the use of swear words I think I'd be on rule 69 hearings every second week or every third, third day at least um, but it's a context thing yeah you know? I'm not going to come on here and swear like a trooper because in context that's not the right thing to do uh, You've, you've got other misconduct can be uh, even down to cheating where someone deliberately just goes and breaks a rule. You know, we've got this whole rule about the you know, boats not to have contact and it's there for a very good reason. You know, these things have a lot of energy and it can be dangerous. So people not you know, deliberately not uh, following the rules can also look at this issue of bringing the sport into disrepute. It's, it's certainly a, a, a breach of good sportsmanship. So. Um, there, there's two examples I can think of. Um, but yeah, you, you, you come back to what the rule says and it's simply it's a, a breach of good manners, good sportsmanship, unethical behaviour, and then or conduct that can bring the sport or could bring the sport into disrepute. It, and, and that's where it's good because then whatever it is, this protest committee should then put that filter on it and go, is it? Not just assume it is, but is it? You mean we've had cases over the last few years of um, sailors entering the Corinthian division when they have paid crew members and they're not eligible, uh, making false declarations to the race committee. Um, there can be all sorts of sorts of offences, and then we see one complaints we we get that are forwarded on to us or asked for advice where they're clearly not misconduct. So there was one in um, that was referred to me by a club and they said, oh, you know, this person's lodged this three page complaint about somebody that they had a minor collision with won't answer their emails. Right. And wanting them a real 69 taken against them. And I just said that you can't do misconduct for not answering somebody's emails. Uh, yeah, that's just annoying. <laughs> so further to then, if we, we've established that it um, could be a misconduct case, what would the committee have to decide then, Steve? Well, the committee needs to decide whether they're going to proceed to a formal hearing. Mm -hmm. And um, so you're going to look at, I mean, how you mean grave the event or the um, the hearing was? You mean we had the situation where the rule books changed recently, and we now talks about if you're going to do more than a warning, you can actually do a warning now without a formal hearing. So the protest committee's got to sit down and decide. You mean it can be, um, and that might be you know. In, what was, you mean, relevant to what was done or what was said or what was carried out. And then once they decide to football me here, call a hearing, then they need to give the person formal notification in writing. You need to give them time to prepare. So you're not going to give them a letter and say, you know, the hearings um, tonight. Mm -hmm. And if somebody says something in a protest committee hearing, you're not going to immediately write them out a thing and saying, right, now we're going to immediately move on to Rule 69. You're going to be saying to them, no, no, go away. And there's a standard format letter from World Sailing that you mean gives you the basis of sending out your notice. So normally you're going to give them a week or two to prepare, tell them they can bring an advisor if they so wish. And um, and that way they've got time to properly prepare 
for something that for some people would be quite a daunting experience. Mm. Mm. Richard, do you have any further comments on that one as it, well? It's sort of steps, isn't it? It's investigate what the investigate it. So has this got legs? And that could be the appointment of an investigator. The next step is, do we want a hearing? And if so, run the hearing. You then get, and if you then just don't think too far ahead, you go through the hearing, do we think there's still misconduct? And if so, should we penalise or not? Once you get past that, you then go, right, if we think we should penalise rather than just warn or one of the others, then what is suitable? I think, Hatchie, you brought up one a good point on time, and this is this is sort of one of those soft issues. I quite like a Rule 69 hearing, and I've learned I've been on both sides of the table, if you like, with some 69 hearings as a rules advisor, and so yeah, as yeah. an advisor, right? And, <laughs> yeah, and one of the things could be that the better there are times with misconduct hearings, especially for example at a regatta, where the quicker you get it done the better. And what I mean by that is if you, if I'd come off the water on day one and there's an issue and I believe it's misconduct, I might then say to them, well, tomorrow morning, we'd like to sit down and have a hearing with you. In other words, we're going to give you time to prepare. But what I don't, what I don't want to do is have it where I go, we'll see you in six weeks, where then the whole thing gets a life of its own. So it's a really good thing to be proportionate, I think. And Steve, you're probably the same. We, if you have hearings at your club every Wednesday for what happened on the Saturday before, maybe that's going to be okay. So I think that the secret is put yourself in probably the person who you might who might be the one being investigated and think, what's a fair amount of time to, to prepare? And don't give them a huge amount, but what's fair? And then suggest with them and, and say, this is what we're planning. Yeah. And that that's that process thing. We're starting to drive into process, not get emotional and just go, here's what we're planning to do. But yeah, the quicker sometimes you can nip it in the bud, the better it can be <laughs> as well. Yeah, all around. We've had a couple of questions in and they're quite similar. Um, I'll ask Lynn's first. She says, does misconduct for Australian sailing only relate to on water and competition aspects of the sport or within the, within the club or at a committee level as well? I'll, I'll have a go and Hatchie can tell me I'm wrong because Hatchie knows yeah. this better than I do. <laughs> I think it has to link to the field of play. If it's linked, so, and that could be off the water. It could be at the at, at the internal prize giving. It could be at the boat park. It could be behaviour like that. But you want to link it to the sporting side. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're doing committee, I think that becomes other aspects to deal with the club and the association that you're involved in. Does that sound right, Hedge? Yeah, no, I mean, that's the way I would go. If somebody comes down and punches somebody on the marina about an incident that happened in the water, you're going to say that's misconduct under Rule 69. If it's two people that are having lunch at the club that are members that get in a punch up, you're going to say that's something for the club's management and committee to look after under their um, their rules. You know, if this is, you know, about a collision in the car park or something you know then you're going to say not real 69 mm -hmm. and the club the club the management could still do something on top of a rule 69 if they're worried about it from a club point of view but i think the protest committee should just look at the sporting aspects yeah and and sometimes the protest committee takes action under rule 69 for something that happens on the water and then the club takes their own action Mm. on top of that again. Yeah. And then I guess that ties into John had a question as well that how do you deal with a complaint after competitors have left an event? Then who's responsible for examining that complaint? That complaint is officially the responsibility of Australian sailing. Um, 
once the um, venues wrapped up and the protest committees wrapped up. Um, so we're talking about like so I think Australian sailing would prefer that the protest committee would um, reform themselves and deal with it, but you I mean there's jurisdictional issues then. Um, so sorry, the event that you give an example of the event that you were referring to then. Yeah, so if you say you mean the the Sydney Harbour Regatta, for instance. Mm -hmm. you know, it's a two-day event, three days for some classes. You know, if something comes up, you know, a week after the event, then it's probably best that the, you know, the organising club deals with it, not, yeah. you mean, because the protest committee's, you know, gone back to Melbourne or Queensland, wherever the um, state judges have come from and for the national jury and... Um, yeah. I, th I think you should still try the club. The, you can try. The, the protest committee should try to, because I think the rule, I'm just going to find it, the rule basically of, of memory goes, the protest committee should try and rehear it or hear it. Mm -hmm. And then if it's not practical to do so or to proceed, then they sort of collect all the information that they've got and pass it through, um, I guess, to, uh, to Australian sailing. But have a go, because... And, it, and the practicality will soon determine where you need to send it. If it's still, a, if you can still deal with it, you've still got some people you can put on it, do so. Yeah, well, and, and I've seen can't. examples where Australian sailing then <clears> has <throat> dealt with it um, because it's just too hard. So yeah, it's best if you can. Um, and you just see what you can do, you mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you you you'll work out when it's not practical, and we, and then when the the rule will say send it to Australian Sailing. The first point of call is the organize the the organizing authority, or the the hosting club. Yeah, it should get together a protest committee if they can, and it may not be the same protest committee. It might be mm -hmm. the the in house protest committee that they would normally have, as opposed mm -hmm. to the event protest committee. Well, yeah. But the, but start there. You, the buck starts with them, yeah, and then yeah. drives the rules drive them out from there. Mm -hmm. And w where would we find more guidance for this? Where whereabouts is more guidance? Oh, Melanie. Ah. <laughs> He's not wrong. <laughs> Go to Melanie. She'll send you to somebody like us. I'm going to cut this bit out of the edit. Yeah, I, I think seriously though. I, I I use the um, the world sailing guidance on it. So <clears throat> on the website, and any good judge or at least the club should have it. The world sailing put out a document on guidance on misconduct, and it's a process. It's it's a reasonable document. And it's quite detailed on what you do, and it's a every time I'll get one, I'll start reading that front to back, just to remind me what we need to do. It's it. It reinforces the process, which is what I like. So yeah. I, I would use that as num number one front and centre. We do have a link to that on our website as well. Under, um, <laughs> God, your website has a link. Yes, uh, which has recently been updated. Um, Steve, do you have any other advice of where, where people can go for guidance other than me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you mean, I, and I agree with Richard, you mean start with the rule book, the misconduct guide. Mm -hmm. um your local member you mean your local state person on the rural specialist group mm -hmm. um where you can um get some advice um because you mean this protest doesn't stop at the protest committee necessarily you mean if a protest committee um penalizes somebody then there's reporting requirements to australian sailing Australian sailing will normally then conduct their own investigations and we've we've had cases where world sailing has then taken action against um, Australian sailors um, and banned them worldwide from the sport for a year or two and I know you mean as Richard said oh you mean I've represented people to, a to world sailing and against world sailing. So I've sent people that I've, you know, recommended to world sailing that they take action. And then I've defended people there as well. And the same at Australian sailing where I've conducted the hearings that, that, that they then run. 
and I've defended people at those hearings. So um, it can um, go on and become more serious because the decision we make at a protest committee is only within the jurisdiction of that protest committee. So if that the organising authorities um, Royal Sydney Yacht Squadron, then the penalties within Royal Sydney Yacht Squadron, unless Australian sailing deal with some other penalty. If the organising authorities, the NS14 class and a club running a, their Australian title, then the jurisdiction sits within that box and the class can say, Rodeo, you've got a two-year ban. You mean the ban goes for the class and the, the club running it. But if for any bigger bans like we see advertised by World Sailing or whatever, it's got to go to those steps. Mm -hmm. And that's where, as Richard was saying before, about the formal process. That's Make right. You've always got to make sure the formal process, because that's going to get uh, reviewed as you move along. Um, and another point I'd make is if you're going to have an investigator, somebody to do the investigation, then, and they're going to the ones that are going to find out all the facts, then you should use them in the hearing to present the case. Yeah, good point. Really good you point. I mean, I represented a team at the Volvo round the world race, and the investigator, a top world sailing judge, said, here's the case. Here's what I found out, but I'm not going to go any further. And that sort of left everybody up in the air. It left me arguing that, well, if nobody's going to present the case, you know, what have you got to argue? Um, so I always say, you mean, they're the people that have actually dealt with the sailors and found out the information. So get them to present the case um, to the protest um, committee. Yeah, that I think Hatchie's got a really good point there. Um, and it, it's in line with what the, you know, they redid this whole misconduct section. And one of and what Hatchie just said is you can see now where it lines up. It means that the protest committee are being the judges of the case. They're not, you know, they're not the the inspectors as well. So they're listening to a, a, a charge on one side and a defence on the other side, which is what we should be doing. You think of all the sailing issues. You, you're listening to the protestor and the protestee. So I, I, I agree, it's, it's not required, but Arad, if you ever have an, an investigator, I think it's good to have someone appointed to, or even if you don't have an investigator, Hatchie, one member gets sort of appointed to present the case. Mm. Mm. Excellent. Thank you, gentlemen. Has anybody got any further questions? Or remarks? You can come off mute now if you like and ask them. I think I think there's a couple of things to to really push, Mel. Um, when you when you're doing this, like uh, misconduct is not an often it's not something that happens as often as other protests. So while everyone else gets a misconduct case and you all it sort of it focuses your mind. I guess the big thing is take the emotion out of it. Just follow the process in the book. You're normally dealing with an issue that's probably emotional. Mm, yeah. Therefore, your job as the judge or the, the protest committee is to not be not get caught up in that emotion. Yeah. Um, and the other thing is, like we said, with that form being formal, is it allows the person to see that you're being transparent and you're disclosing stuff. I think that's that's going to be a big case. Put yourself in their shoes and because what they're really wanting to make sure is they've had a chance to to argue their case. You know, it's not just those people at the club, you know, they had it in for me. You mm. quietly sit there and you go, this is your allegation. Tell me why this is not true or tell me why you think this is not misconduct. Those type of that exercise. Um, so I think there that those parts should always be done. And then the last one I'd just sit there and say is it's quite clear in misconduct that you want to stick to the specifics. Um, you do this letter 
and that's what Hatchie's again right, that the standard letter in the guidance is a good start. And one of the things it says is be very specific. So if someone had a complaint that I called another sailor that yeah, they reminded me of an English rugby league player, which obviously is gross misconduct because it's, it's <laughs> abuse. Um, don't sit there and write a letter saying you said something rude. You would quote it back. We heard on this date that you said this and in quotes, this is it. So again, you're making sure that the person has a chance to, to you know, fully understand what the allegation is against them. So I and, think those ones are good. Sorry, Richard. Uh, John Stanley had a question. Uh, yeah, not a question so much, Melanie, as a comment. Um, mm -hmm. One of the things that I find with these things is that people are very reluctant to go ahead with a Rule 69 hearing. Um, nobody likes to be taking disciplinary action against people that you may or may not know or colleagues. But I think it's very important that we do because the more you allow poor behaviour to continue, uh, the worse poor behaviour is going to get and we end up with bigger problems. Um, and the other thing that I would say is I've been involved with several things where the club has decided it doesn't want to have a Rule 69 hearing because it might make the club look bad in the, for the rest of the world. Whereas what we're actually trying to do is prevent the, the whole of the sailing sport. So if somebody's done something wrong on the water and that person should be given a six months holiday, he shouldn't just be allowed to be banned from his club for six months. He should actually be um, thrown out of the sport for six months if it's that serious. And by just taking club action, you don't necessarily take people off the water. So let's make sure we're trying to keep our own sport as clean as we can. Well, further to your six months, as you're talking about, Colleen asks, what type of penalties are applied to some of these cases? And uh, she's asking from a club level. Well, Hatchie had made a point. You, you've got a boundary. You're the protest committee of an event and you've only got those limitations within that event that you've been appointed to. So from a, you know, from the first level is you go from anything from warning through to you're out of this event. Mm -hmm. So be it a, you know, a regatta or be it a series, you know, if it's at a club level, you might say, sorry, the rest of the winter series, you're, you're not sailing. You, that person, that person is out and or that boat has a penalty but that's where your limit is so Colleen if you, you're worried about the um, you guys as a protest committee aren't the ones deciding to chuck someone out of the sport that's where you would make that penalty you know see you later you're not coming back for the rest of this week you would report it to Australian Sailing who had themselves have a process to see if they take it further because that's also that it's fair, you know, as the pe penalty potentially gets bigger, the person should have another chance to defend themselves too. You mean, we, th you mean, we banned a person at the CYC for, I think, two years and they, and said, you know, you can't sail at the club for two years. You mean, they walk 100 metres down to Ransa and go sailing there. Um, unless Australian sailing takes, you know, action. You had sort of a choice. If you still got it linked to the sporting side, you certainly have that choice to run a misconduct on that. And one of the things you're doing with the misconduct hearing, you're also showing to the people who were the innocent parties to this, the victims to this, you could say, that you're taking action. And that is one of the things we need to be aware of is, um, the person who this has been perpetrated against, do they feel that the sport is protecting them? Um, so there's that benefit. But if it's you know if it's in the change rooms, you're sort of in that grey zone where you could do both. Um, but in in that scenario, I guess as you as a member of the club she's in, because that's not the organising authority, the misconduct would be the first stage, if you like to probably make it bigger to, so it could get to Australian sailing to have a look at. So, you know, I think when you got people feeling like that, m my feeling would be to look at the person who was the victim and think, how do we support her? And maybe a 69 hearing would get it so that she realises the sport's taking it seriously. And then you're 
club could take action as well. Oh, yeah. 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 All right. Thanks. That's basically what we did. We spoke to the, the victim, if you like. Um, I was then reassured everybody present that I would take it up with my club once you know we were back onto a home turf. Um, the end result was that the perpetrator um, has not been seen in the sport since that day. So we ended up not having to do anything because I think she realised her name was mud from that time forward. Um, and we haven't seen her back. So, But it was a very difficult situation at the time and a very unfortunate incident. Mm. Thanks. Um, we've, we've had another question. Come on, let me go back to... OK, so um, John says an extension to Lynn's question. With um, bullying emails at committee level, seems that they should be addressed under workplace bullying guidelines, but these applied in a paid workforce. Can they be used for club and voluntary situations? Steve, it sounds like you've got more of a handle on that. I of... would say, you mean, yeah, that's something for the club's management to to deal with. That, you mean, doesn't matter whether it's a voluntary workforce or um the law about bullying and harassment applies to to those people because it's still a workplace. It's um, whether it's a voluntary one as or not. So yeah, you mean the club's management under their policies and procedures should deal with that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and then Craig asks: Under what circumstances does a misconduct get es escalated from a protest committee? to Australian Sailing and who makes that decision? Uh, the rules state, I think, if you give more than a warning, and I'll just find it, if you give a penalty greater than one, do not a, uh, a, a DNE. Are these rules in the World Sailing misconduct? Um, this is in the racing in the rules of sailing. Oh. <gasps> should yeah. know that, sorry. Deep in the book, it's, that, but, Basically, if the protest committee gives a serious penalty, excludes them from the event, or they think it's important, it shall send the findings and the facts to Australian Sailing. Mm -hmm. So the, it's, you, again, if you follow through the process, you go down and you've gone to, okay, we do want to penalise this person. What do we penalise it? The next stage of that would be then we send the report. The rule clearly states our job is now to send the report to Australian Sailing. And then, and that is then when it instigates further. Um, Joanne has got her hand up. Hi, everyone. This might be a bit of a basic question. I'm quite new. I'm actually more, I'm on the committee at um, Chelsea at my club, but I work in human resources as well. So I'm just really interested and in also for the way that we manage, you know, any complaints and misconduct at our club. So you're talking about the letters and, you know, of course, being really specific about the behaviour or the language that was observed. Um, so in an environment where there's quite a few people on the boat or on the marina or on the beach, is the person, the complainants, are they, do they have to be identified or they um, or they remain anonymous in the process or do they need to actually be part of the procedural process? You said a hard one. No. <laughs> They're quiet for a moment, Joanne. That's odd. Yeah. Well, normally you you receive you receive a written report. So somebody you mean produces a report or goes and makes a complaint. You mean might go and make a complaint to the sailing office who will then yep. um, write that up and decide they might want to take some action. But the person's going to need to give um evidence or whatever you mean we can't go on an unsubstantiated hearsay um yeah but as the as the race officers yes having you know that information or the protest committee but is that information about who the person is that made has made that complaint um to the person that is accountable you know who's been complained about <clears throat> At the end of the day, it could get that because if that's if they were the only person who heard it and it was questionable whether you know in that case something was said, yeah, yeah. 
you've got to be at a, you know, the protest committee want to know what evidence have you got? And, yeah. and I, the first thing I'm thinking is normally we need to show that evidence to the person, you know, to the, to the person being investigated. Yeah. And I wonder if there was a way, and this is where I'd go and do some homework and go, is there a way where we have it locked in? But I, I keep thinking of those, uh, you know, cases where it's, uh, you know, BW <laughs> will assign a code or something. But I think the first step is you, you'd be explaining, saying, well, we need to be able to prove this and, and explain it the to the person. Um, and then I'd, that would be where you'd phone a friend and we'd go and say, well, if the person really wants to be uh, kept you know, anonymous, then let's see what can happen. And yeah. that, that's a good point about looking after that person. They've made a complaint. They're, they're probably feeling a little bit shell-shocked themselves. So yeah. you've got to protect them in that way. And you say, hey, and that's where you step it through. You formalise it. That's why I like to formalise it. You sort of, hey, the next stage is this. We, we will be using that. We would like to talk to you again. And you just, you know, I'm not expert on this, as in compared to people who do this for a living, you know, lawyers and police and stuff. But I just think you've got to, I put myself in the other, both of the other party's shoes going, okay, this is just a sport. Let's just ask them and let them know what we're doing so that they're aware of it as well. Yeah, no, fair enough. Just kind of keeping in mind, you know, that often we'll have, you know, younger people in boats and around the area as well. So, you know, where you want to give them that option that they can absolutely report if they feel uncomfortable around language or things that have been said. Um, but yeah, anyway, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. You mean you mean I, I have um chaired and hearing where the report actually came from the police. And the police had investigated an incident and then lodged their report with the club saying, We think this needs to be followed up under the rules of the sport, which we did. So Things come to us in different formats. Colleen has another question. Colleen? Um, yes, is that working okay? Different Colleen. Yes. Hello. Yes. There you go. Uh, hi. Um, I just, I just um, being in the sailing office myself, um, I do have people come to me and they say, oh, you know, um, I can think of a scenario, um, a skipper came in and, his wife regularly helms and she was feeling very intimidated by another skipper off another boat. Um, and we talked through, you know, um, some some of this misconduct and, and inappropriate behaviour. But what if the race committee observes and hears inappropriate uh, behaviour by a skipper to another competitor and you can see that that skip is intimidating that other person and they just, you know, whatever they do on the course, bear away and just stay out of the person's way. How do, the, how do you deal with the race? Can the race committee then go ahead with a Rule 69 um, complaint as well? I, I'm, I'm assuming you can, but I'm just, yeah, interested. Yeah. Actually? Yeah, I'd say yes. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Um, it's just a report. Yeah, it's it's like you I mean they the race committee might give us a report that they saw a boat, you know, short. You I mean sail two hundred meters short of the mark and then go back up the course and continue on in the race and finish. And you I mean that's something we'd investigate, you know, for misconduct, deliberately um, breaking the rules, deliberately cheating. Yeah. The the rule talks about a report from any source, so definitely race committee, you know, they're there. And it also means you go back to that other question, the person being intimidated doesn't have to stand up and be the one giving the evidence now. You've got the first-hand evidence of the race committee saying, I observed this, you know, this boat was intimidating, the other boat. So you've got yourself your first-hand witness. You've got your, your, you've got the facts. Excellent. Well, I don't think there's any more questions. Thank you, everyone, for um, for joining in with that. Gentlemen, do you have any last pieces of advice or, or closing comments, as it were? Follow the rules, follow the misconduct guide from World Sailing.
And, and my last one is just that emotion. You know, I think as an official, you follow that down, you just take the process and it will be fine. It's and, and it goes normally much better. You get caught up in the emotion and it just never works. And, and think about who you're going to put on the protest committee. You mean, try to find those, you know, level-headed, impartial, you know, people that you use. Excellent. Thank you. Well, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, I hope that gives you a little bit more insight um, and I hope that you don't find yourself having to have one anytime soon though. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Okay. Thanks everyone. Thanks all. Thank you all. Thanks.